morning. Thank you for joining us today on this special occasion for the release of the book Fundamentals of the Dominican Voluntary Sector. This is a special occasion for us. This book offers a deep analysis of the improvements and challenges uh, the NGOs faces in the Dominican Republic. My name is Yamile Eusebio Paulino, acting co-executive director of the Global Foundation for Democracy and Development and director of educational programs and internships at our sister institution in the Dominican Republic, Fundación Global Democracia y Desarrollo. Uh, I would like to take the opportunity to thank the presence of uh, one of our uh, GFDD advisory committee, Mr. Anthony Davidson. Thank you for coming. Also, I extend our gratitude to Ambassador uh, of the Mission of the Dominican Republic to the United Nations, Mr. Ambassador Juan Avila, and of our friend Bill Cassidy. Thank you all for coming today and join us for this special presentation. GFDD and Funglode are dedicated to promote research and raise awareness through educational programs in all areas concerning sustainable development in the Dominican Republic and in the rest of the world. This is the core part of our mission. We seek to present initiatives that contribute to the public policy making at a national and international level. Another major part of our work is to sponsorship and present Public, uh, publication series and researches of projects that address critical international issues from local to global perspectives. In this occasion, we are presenting the work of our fellow Megan Bedo. This research <coughs> takes into consideration the external environmental factors and internal organizational characteristics that shape the voluntary sector of the Dominican Republic while illustrating a classic evolution of this endeavor in a, de in a developing country. Considering the advances of the education, economic, sustainable development, transportation, and agricultural sector in the Dominican Republic after the end of the dictatorship uh, in 1961, the voluntary sector is facing some challenges, but is heading in a, the right direction. <coughs> Even though the views of unfund, and findings contained in this book are solely the, the responsibility of the, out, the author, GFDD is fortunate to have researchers such as Mrs. Medo, Bedo, who triggers conversations among all involved in sectors and enhance our knowledge in areas that we might not think would be affected by political or economic factors. We hope this research will contribute to a better understanding of the world and empower readers to act in more informed, efficient, and ar ar harmonious way. Uh, also, I would like to thank Mr. Mr. Cyril Ritchie, the president of the Confederation of NGO Congo, to this support for supporting the, pre the presence of one of our speakers. For me, it's an honor uh, to introduce Mr. Liberato Bautista. He is the Assistant General Secretary for the United Nations and International Affairs of the General Board of Church and Society of the United Methodist Church. He represents the international non-governmental organization as main representative to the United Nations worldwide and has served in his capacity for more than 21 years. Bautista is in the immediate past president of the Committee of Religious NGOs at the United Nations. He's also the immediate past president of Congo uh, in between 2007 to 2011. And Bautista was chair of the Council of Organizations in New York uh, of the United Nations Association of the USA. We can sit here and talk a lot of more about Mr. Bautista <laughs> uh, because he has a very long-standing experience. But I think that we can uh, take a take a look of what we have given to you about the speakers' bios for this for this day. I would like to ask Mr. Bautista to join us, please. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Yamile, for the introduction. Welcome to the Church Center for the United Nations, uh, which is a United Methodist facility. Uh, we, we built this in 1963. My organization built this in 1963, largely with United Methodist women money. In 1996, we said to the women, we're giving you back the building so we don't have to pay you back the money we owe you. 
So it's, it's now being administered by the United Methodist Women. But some of you perhaps do not also know that it was the Methodist Church in London that hosted the first General Assembly of the United Nations. There was no building then, so it was the Methodists in London at the Methodist Central Hall where the first General Assembly of the United Nations was held, where the Security Council, the International uh, uh, Court of Justice uh, were all born uh, at that particular session. And so we take pride in being present here physically with our building and the kind of work that we do. So thank you very much for uh, the invitation. But uh, I, I think I come here more in terms of my being uh, the former uh, president of the committee of the uh, Conference of Non-Governmental Organization in consultative relationship with the United Nations. Uh, Mr. Cyril Ritchie, the current president uh, who is based in Geneva, uh, could not be here. And uh, it is my pleasure to uh, represent him and the position uh, not necessarily his understanding of the issues. So I, I blame only myself for some of the ideas that I, I'd like to present to you. Uh, the, the, the topic is quite uh, an expansive one, the role of NGOs, uh, uh, and especially the importance of that role in relation to the pursuit of sustainable development. What I'd like to do today is to challenge you to look at that role not only in relation to development, which is one of the three pillars of the United Nations system, but to look at it some more holistically in relation to the pillar that deals with human rights and human dignity, the pillar that deals with, uh, uh, with prosperity and development, which we usually just truncate it under the more popular uh, term, uh, sustainable development, and then the third pillar that deals with peace and security. That all of this uh, should be part of our imagination of not just statecraft. And for that matter, uh, Your Excellency, uh, thank you very much for indeed for uh, the, the abidance that you give to such an excellent non-governmental organization. Uh, like the uh, global, uh, I still keep uh, global foundation for uh, for uh, democracy and development, and its uh, counterpart in the Dominican Republic, uh, Funglode. Uh, so, congratulations indeed for a very timely and relevant focus, such as the revisiting and perhaps even a reimagination of the place and role of the voluntary sector, a category shared in many ways by the terms non-governmental, civil society, and in large measure the term private sector. And then there are terms which we also use, uh, sometimes too glibly, as to deny their analytical and even mobilization, mobilizational power. I'm talking of terms like grassroots movements, base communities, or comunidades eclesiales de base, as they would say it in, in the uh, Spanish-speaking uh, world, uh, for particularly those who are working in, in faith-based organizations. Uh, and then, people's organizations, and such other terms. Another term that intersects these other, these other terms I have already mentioned is non-profit, which then raises a problem if everything that is non-governmental is lumped under the private sector, public sector being that which is by and of governments. There certainly is a wide swath in the world of private sector when we talk about access to resources, especially financial resources. So if uh, it's non-governmental and non-profit, well, the non-profit uh, straddles between the big NGOs who would certainly are not, prof not for profit, but they have a lot of financial resources, and the grassroots resources whose fundamental capital is themselves and their vision and commitment for a just and democratic society. Uh, former staff of uh, GFDD, Mark Jordan, who I believe is now in London, uh, 
speaks of this in the preface he wrote up about the report, which characterizes very well what I think I have just said. He says, the success of NGOs in achieving their mission has been mixed dependent on their size, network, geographical location, and other such criteria, unquote. So the timeliness of this event, occasioned by the presentation of a published research report, uh, comes on the heels of assaults and challenges to our imagination and practice of democracy and development, about which the GFDD and the Fundación Global Democracia y Desarrollo are about in their work, in their work. Congratulations are indeed in order to Yamile for this illustrative and informative research by uh, Ms. Megan uh, Bero, uh, which is focused on the fundamentals of the voluntary sector in the Dominican Republic. Ms. Bero has done us a great favor by sharing her research to the wider public and for uh, GFDD to include this as its 13th offering, I'm sure it's not ominous uh, for the bad, it's just <laughs> ominous for the good, as the 13th offering in your uh, research and study series, uh, is, uh, research and idea series. Uh, I was looking at the previous 12 and it demonstrates the expanse of themes uh, that you have, uh, that you have uh, uh, published. Uh, contributions that are not only germane to the Dominican national imagination and discourse, but I, I must say, just looking at living through, and I already apologize to uh, uh, Megan that I have not read the entire report, <laughs> but uh, living through uh, its uh, table of contents and some of the words I was trying to spot just for my own reflection, they contribute even more so to the international discourse, and I think presenting it to this community is most important. So it gives me great pleasure to make a few remarks, a few in the form of assertions some and some ideas for consideration. I started my remarks by speaking about revisiting and reimagining our notions and practice of democracy and development, that being partly because it is the fundamental principle around which the foundation is built and perhaps the very imagination why you would invite mm -hmm. a research uh, by uh, Megan and the others uh, to be part of the body of work of the foundation. That is exactly, if I may say so, the enterprise that the, the, the reimagination of, of democracy and development is the very enterprise that Miss Bedo pulls us into, uh, and I, I encourage you, including myself, to read from page one to the last. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, my assignment, and I hope you consider yours too. Yamile's uh, foreword is important to consider. She said, any sector of government cannot be analyzed without considering a detailed vision of the political economic and social evolution of a society, unquote. What Ms. Bedo has done for us is to provide a documentary characterization of the elements that make for the Dominican voluntary sector to be either a grouping to be reckoned with in society or one that is self-imagined, self-constructed, or inhibited by policy so that the sector becomes impotent and inutile in the face of larger, including moneyed interests in society. Now, that sentence, of course, is editorial uh, comment on Ms. Bedo's presentation, but that to me is the importance of what she did. She did not only document what the private sector does, but embed that his in the history that is social, economic, cultural in the Dominican Republic and look at how that history impedes or enhances the role of the private sector. So I look forward again to reading the entire report, if only because of, of, of the import. Uh, it seems to me that it is not only a good read, it is a crucial read. 
uh, be only because of my own musings into the necessary nexus between the local and the global. It might sometimes when you get a title of a research which is the Dominican Voluntary Sector, ah, it's about the Dominican Republic, and for some of the other, you know, geographically uh, challenged, I said, they may be thinking of the Dominica instead of the Dominican Republic. So then I say, ah, you know, I don't have to read this. If you had that initial inkling, please don't. Go read because it is, it, 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 it addresses some of the crucial challenges of the non-governmental sector, which today, for those of us who have consultative status at the United Nations, the Committee of NGOs of ECOSOC is calling for a revisiting of the consultative and access relations of NGOs with respect to the United Nations. It is, a, it is an exercise necessary for GFDD, for Congo members, for all of us who have access to the, U to the UN, uh, otherwise from a status that is either state observer or, or, uh, or related agencies of the UN. It could be imperative, the access, if we do not uh, uh, involve ourselves in the, in the conversation. I say what the research has done is to provide the clear nexus between the local and the global. For my own philosophical and practical work, the local and the global are simultaneous realities. I'm a Filipino citizen, I remain to be so, I choose to be so, and for most of, for more than half of my life, I lived in the Philippines. Manila was my local, New York was global to me. Now, Manila is my global, New York is my local. So Manila and New York are simultaneously local and global, and that to me philosophically is an important grounding to how we look ourselves who make intervention as private sector entities in a setting like the United Nations because there's a certain arrogance at thinking that we need to have self-critical lenses for, especially because of our understanding that international law becomes important only when they become part of municipal domestic law. So those of us who intervene across the street from this vantage <coughs> must remind ourselves that in reality when pinned to the ground our venerable uh, diplomats, they say we'll have to check capital. We'll have to check with the capital. In other words, what we do here is check with, with Santo Domingo, with Manila first uh, because that is where it matters and so that the Dominican focus of the report is crucial, not only because it is about Dominican Republic, but because it is fixed to the local and the global that are simultaneous realities. A few more remarks. Uh, so if the local and the global are not so much as independent <laughs> realities, but as simultaneous realities, it is therefore important for us to look at democracy if they were truly about of the people, by the people, and for the people. Then that should charge us to the role of reimagining the national and the international. And how that imagination works, knowing and realizing that our imagination of the national and the international is a legacy of Westphalia, of the Treaty of Westphalia, that produced the modern nation states that we know today. And the concomitant principle to that legacy, which is sovereignty, sovereignty. In a world of nation states, how do we then account for the role of NGOs, which we self-ascribe as necessary, and secretaries general one after the other, and well-meant international public servants of the UN system agree that NGOs are a necessary element, are, are, are important actors in a multi-stakeholder process at the United Nations. So as a sector, that is needed, if not crucial, in giving 
if not subs substance, at least semblance, to democracy, meaning increased, expansive, democratic participation in a decidedly democratic governance a framework that the UN and the member states come around together to agree, if not always, every now and then, when they craft a global compact on migration, intentionally fall out of the way. That's an editorial comment. Ms. Beto seems to have invited us to look at the experience of NGOs in the Dominican Republic, in particular their participation in pursuing sustainable development goals in the manner imagined by the international, by the multilateral system, i.e. the production of Agenda 2030, uh, which is again just like its predecessor uh, uh, a Millennium Development Goals is the most acceded to and the most widely participated in uh, in terms of the many multilateral processes in the UN system. Uh, the most immediate contribution, I think, of, of, of Megan uh, is to the theory and practice of NGOs that is in making her report accessible to both the scholarly academician and the grassroots practitioner. Here's one book that talks about Congo. I mean, I have 13 books, academic books, actually, that have chapters on the Conference of Dagan Governmental Organization. To check my sanity as a representative of an NGO, I write, I speak like this, I publish my work, I teach in undergraduate and graduate universities even up to now, just to check my sanity. It's my way of critiquing my own practice. Being a representative of the United Methodist Church worldwide at the United Nations already gives me the restrictions of what I can say officially on behalf of the church. What I cannot say officially because of my, in terms of the hat I wear, I am able to say when I'm inside a classroom. Or I can assign my students and say, can you research what the United Methodist Church does on this subject matter? Don't worry that I am a representative, do it from a, an honest goodness academic uh, enterprise uh, uh, using critical lenses. And I think this is what uh, Megan has done for us, uh, especially because there is a, 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 a scarcity of scholarly sources, as, as, she, as she put it in her introduction, benchmarking the composition and activity of NGOs in the, the Democratic Republic. I think the key word there is benchmarking the transparency and accountability that we NGOs call governments to exhibit, call member states to exhibit, call the multilateral system to exhibit, including the international financial institutions, World Bank and IMF, should be the same benchmarking we do to ourselves. How do we account for the money we receive? How do we account for the governance system? How do we elect our leadership? How do we turn over leadership to another set and not perpetuate ourselves? How do we not go into dictatorship again? How do we not dictate the mechanisms through which governance and the identification? And that is an important setting for your research because you have identified the experience of dictatorship in the Dominican Republic, one that resonates very well, because my wife and I were underground activists during the Marcos period, uh, the Marcos dictatorship, and so I can Im the, the imagination of what the domestic NGO can do is important to be factored in in the multilat international multilateral system, because in reality, it is what the grassroots private sector does that truly matters. Uh, just two more remarks, and um, the talkative me will stop. <laughs> uh, so it has been my, the, the other part of, of the role I think that I've been invited here to, to be with you is, is again, the, the, the role that I have played uh, with respect to uh, the, uh, the, uh, of the Congo, the Conference of NGOs. Uh, it has been my good fortune to be a paid staff of an NGO rather than a volunteer staff because I've been able to put you know, all of my work, uh, not just in the representation that I hold, but in relation to a collective undertaking which Congo is about. Uh, I have been associated with 
NGO since 1976. So this is what? 42 years. It's 42 years of NGO. I have known no other work except in the NGO world, and that was since 1976. In fact, I have known, uh, no, sorry, this is my 21st year representing the Public Policy and Social Justice Agency of the Worldwide United Methodist Church. In all these years, I have also been equally fortunate to have served, to have been associated with Congo, and it is in that setting that I met the, the uh, uh, leaders and members of GFDD. Uh, and as Yamile said, I served as its president in 2007 until 2011. Your theme on sustainable development is crucial uh, because crucial from the lens of Congo and GFDD is a respectable member of the board of directors and I believe you are coming to, to Geneva for the General Assembly of Congo which will be held in less than two weeks, March 1, 2, and 3. And Congo has launched in October last year with the then uh, Assistant Secretary General Thomas Gass, some of you not many of you know him. He has since uh, gone back to Switzerland to, uh, to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but Tom Gass uh, came to Vienna at the meeting of the Board of Directors to launch the one-year focus of Congo uh, in support of uh, the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, but the General Assembly in, in Geneva uh, in early March will be the bigger celebration uh, of, of, of Congo's commitment. And, and it, will, it will call on the substantive committees and our good brother there, uh, Daniel LeBlanc, is a very uh, a dedicated member of the substantive committees. There will most likely be a call uh, for all substantive committees to make uh, direct and official uh, support of the SDGs. Not that they do not already do but at the global le level, a call to support, uh, support that. Uh, one last point. NGOs, depending on who their constitu constituencies are and what their mission and objectives are, interpret the United Nations pillars in many different ways. They are inexhaustible, in fact, limited only by how we restrict our imagination and how much walls we erect to separate us from others whose desire for, and this is, uh, this is I, 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 I use this phraseology as a matter of challenge to the way we approach sustainable development in the way I said earlier, and I close it this way. The, the three pillars of peace and security, prosperity and development, and human rights and human dignity, my own take on that goes like this that the desire of nation states and peoples irrespective of imagined and actual boundaries set by the nation state sovereign system or other imagined systems would be like this. The pursuit for food and freedom, jobs and justice, land and liberty. Notice my play on, on letters, FF, food and freedom, it just helps my mind work that way. Food and freedom, jobs and justice, land and liberation, or land and liberty. The pairing very much mirrors our understanding of the key foundational undergirding principle which we call human rights and human dignity. Food refers to the social economic rights. Freedom refers to the civil and the political. So the two convinced food and freedom, something that is real, tangible, and visible, freedom, something that is aspirational, and then the other one is jobs and justice, one that every private sector, every government wants to make sure it gives its own people, jobs and justice. And the third one is land and liberation. And I think the Dominican Republic's own struggles up to the ownership of its own within its own territory for the land is, is crucial today. That is why our NGO work pushes us to a reimagination, uh, another one, of what it means to be a global citizen. 
global citizenry, the push for education for global citizenship, therefore comes uh, very urgent, uh, uh, urgently. So this is truly what we must mean by global citizenry that is needful of rearing in these days and times of increasing unilateralism by the multilateral participants. Uh, that's quite an oxymoron. When the, when the actors of the multilateral system are increasingly trying to exhibit unilateralism, some much more in your face, uh, getting out of the GCM process is one example. So what we are about as NGOs is the building of communities and alliances of hope beyond any divide and boundary. This building a world that to me should be beyond the nation state and it should therefore be planetary. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, thank you Levi, as many friends call you, <laughs> for your input and willingness to be part of this event. Um, I would like to take the opportunity to inform you that we have uh, our third speaker will be via Skype. He's over there on the laptop right back. So as soon as Megan uh, does her presentation, he will have some remarks. Uh, it's a pleasure to me to present you, introduce you to Megan Bedo. Megan is a nonprofit advocate and academic from USA, from Florida, USA, with over a decade of experience <laughs> in program design and project management in the US, Mexico, and Chile. She participated in the fellows program from June to August 2015. Her academic background start with a Bachelor of Arts in Mathematics, Sociology, and Spanish from Florida Southern College and a Master of Public Affairs, specializing in international nonprofit man management with a Master of Arts in Caribbean and Latin American Studies from Indiana University. Megan hopes her, wor her work can help practitioners, founders, and policymakers alike contribute to strengthening the civil society. Megan, the floor is yours. <laughs> well, I could have asked for better introductions. Um, especially the parts that will make the presentation even faster because they've already given you an overview of some really key points. <laughs> um, There's so many things that I want to highlight um, just based off of what you all have said. I, I thank you for understanding this idea of nexus. I, I love connecting the local to the global. Um, I am working in, in Florida now and just being in this space with you all is so exciting to me to remember uh, there's something a little bit bigger than me uh, that we're even if I don't get to push on that corner of the world every day that you all are doing that type of work, that we can work together, we can think together. And, um, and the idea of what is your local, my local just changed. I actually work, ooh, that's gonna catch me in my throat. I actually work for um, the school system that was affected by the shooting yesterday. And so, I came, um, of course, with my own emotions, but also excited to talk about the voluntary sector with you all. Excited to engage and just think um, other people who are meeting families one-on-one -on -one today. There are people that are impacting policy. There are people who are thinking of our nations, who are thinking of our world. And I can trust that the voluntary sector is out there working for that good for our global citizens. Um, and the fact that we can just come and honor them, that we can formalize discussions around what they're doing, um, is such a great thing to celebrate. And I'm really excited to be doing that with GFDD and with Funglode. Um, this research pathway uh, was just, um, I felt like a miraculous find and it couldn't have been a better fit um, because there really are, um, as Mr. Bautista said, they're really actively engaged um, and you're doing the grassroots work right alongside policy, and that's, that's wonderful. So um, for those of you that are in the voluntary sector, for those of you that encourage the voluntary sector, I just come with a, an increased appreciation again today um, and thanking you for your time to be here and the work that you're a part of. So um, as I said, my purpose today is just to celebrate what I was able to do in the summer of 2015. Um, gathering some anecdotal data, gathering the quantitative data, and just beginning to benchmark what's happening in the DR. 
And I was asked to um, generalize parts of my presentation so that I hope we can continue to have a discussion on what will be best globally in our voluntary sector. Um, and I'll also leave place for um, Severin to give us the specifics of the DR and some updates that I might not even know about as we think of local context. So um, again, just this idea of discussion. And I've been a teacher, so I'm always about engagement. Um, and I look forward to our uh, questions and answers at the end, just to see how we can go from taking analysis into practice. So you've heard a little bit about me already. Um, I am a practitioner first turned researcher. So I was able to um, really be on staff in a few different countries. <coughs> and then I took um, my studies to Indiana University, uh, one of the premier um, nonprofit studies in the USA, and just say, OK, what are we going to do to continue to enhance um, our sector? Because again, I take the hypothesis that the voluntary sector, the third sector, nonprofits, I use them interchangeably, are good and necessary, that they fill a gap between public offices and um, the private for-profit sector. And um, so when I came to Fongrode, I first was speaking to one of the previous staff members, and I said, I want to talk about collaboration and organizations and, and how that's happening in the DR, because um, that's something I'm excited about. And she said, yes, but that'll be difficult. <laughs> and I said, I'll do it anyway. And then I got to Santo Domingo, I started, I have a beautiful survey I can't wait to use again one day. And I just said, there's no academic background for me to quote in my paper about nonprofits. Maybe I should start there. <laughs> so um, you'll see that my interests are, are divergent and yet just centering around how we can begin to practice uh, in the civil society a little bit smoother. And then, thought on a personal note, you should know I really did work in the Dominican Republic. It has it all as the national motto might say, um, but I also was able to enjoy the locations and the people personally as well as professionally um, through interviews and just my travels around the country. So I thought I'd give a shout out to Las Carreras because it is fabulous. If you haven't been yet, I think you need a spring vacation. Um, so it's not my style to read everything, so I'm just gonna go off of these slides a little bit, but for those of you that prefer it. Um, as um, was said in the introductions, there are a plethora of types of uh, nonprofits, and they can range from your local grassroots group, your community engagement, um, your neighborhood watch group, uh, and then they might become more formalized, and they start to um, look like domestic startups that are focusing maybe on a city or maybe on a one particular issue. And they can grow, and they can become national, and they can become collective, where they start repeating their regional offices um, to even this idea of this global, international NGO that's uh, taking their mission and their thought power abroad and across borders. So this is a broad topic, this voluntary sector, whether you're doing it on a nation that's smaller or larger, the voluntary sector has a lot to offer. And so this um, preliminary kind of benchmark is just to say, what was true in the DR um, around the summer of 2015? What did we know about that time that enhanced NGOs? And what might limit or prohibit them? So I took um, data from a multitude of areas and then intermixed it with anecdotes in the report because, um, as Libe said, I'm interested in a practitioner being able to pick this up and maybe piece through and find something of import as much as it being um, the voice of the Dominican in this like sector. So um, I was able to speak with local practitioners across the country, different size organizations, and I mixed that with state level public records. Um, the Dominican Republic has a center for the promotion and development of nonprofit organizations, so I was lucky enough that they had a database um, updated somewhat regularly. And um, there's even a 2017 list. I was excited to see there's new data since I was reading through everything. And so um, that and things like the public laws with the Attorney General's office then took uh, one filter higher to international statistics. Um, if you can't tell, I'm kind of a data head. You will be able to tell in the paper. I had to cut a lot more out than I looked into. <laughs> 
But it's exciting to use work from the United Nations, from the World Bank, from International uh, Development Bank, and these type of global thinkers, and pull them together and say, what's really happening um, in a broad uh, macro environmental sense? So the structure of this investigation um, was overall to look at the macro environment and to see what are the things that are happening in the DR that we can maybe hold constant so that after we know what's happening in the external environment, we can look at an individual nonprofit and say, hmm, what's going to be best for your success? Where do you want, what strategy will fit? Um, and so my main pillars, again, there are more, I'm sure you can think of. I functioned, um, or I formulated my analysis around the institutional factors, the political factors, economic, and social. And um, just for a little review of what this might mean, and again, to get down into what the work looks like. On the institutional side, looking at the formation, the infrastructure of things like the laws and the national processes. And the DR law um, 12205 oversees how nonprofits <coughs> can organize, how they register the necessities of a board and um, different ways that they be can become formalized with the state. Again, um, not all nonprofits are formalized, but that is one way of um, seeking legitimacy and, in this context. And processes also include things like um, how do you apply to get nonprofit status? Um, the DR happens to have a way to um, receive a grant from the national budget. What does that look like? What's the timeline? So those are the things uh, I consider institutional. <clears throat> Move on, and um, for any context, the political context, um, is constantly changing, and it gets as simple as um, what type of government do we have? How many parties are there? How often are they changing? Are they interacting? Who do they represent? And within that, our organizations, do they have their own politics? How do they engage with that national scope? Um, economics, I was able to really think about how the DR is um, a growing economy, what that means as we begin to uh, seek investments, what priorities are from the national stage, and even <coughs> when possible um, individually, where, is, where are remittances going? Where is the kinship money flowing? Um, one observation on nonprofit legitimacy in the DR at the time of my writing um, is that the federal uh, average wage for someone that might work in the sector was lower than the market basket, meaning if you only worked for a nonprofit, it would be difficult to pay for the basic necessities for your family of shelter and food, transportation. And so I saw, at least in my observations, this led to um, a more youthful professionalism in the nonprofit sector, maybe before families were larger, or maybe um, you're still living at home, or maybe you're volunteering while you go to school. And so it'll be interesting to see if and how that changes um, because I know myself, I've been blessed to be employed by a job, and it was great when it could be my only job when I worked in a nonprofit. And so um, that's one factor. And we just finalized with social, which is probably just as clear as the others, but we're thinking about demographics, thinking about the religious background, social class, um, and just anything that really defines that local context and might come into how one organizes their nonprofit. So, I took these external factors and I tried to streamline that a little bit, but it's packed. I promise I cut out more than half of it in the paper. It was hard for me to reread it when I picked it up years <laughs> later. I, I, you know, it, it's a good skim read. It's okay. I, it's acceptable. Um, but really, just looking at these external factors and saying if these things are true and we hold these um, as constant, then I want to look at the individual NGO. And there's different ways that it might define itself. Um, just like your own identity, you might choose one thing that's a priority over another. And for the purpose of the report, I was able to look at four. So I really wanted to see mission. What are the um, programs and purpose of import in the DR? And by, as defined by these nonprofits. The reputation um, is a word that I use to speak on kind of the size of an organization. How um, has it been able to sustain itself? How long has it been around? How many employees does it host? Scope in this context 
is the idea of, are we looking more at a neighborhood, a municipality, a region, international? Because of course your strategy changes based on your population. And um, the site of incorporation, I'm interested to look at how many domestic NGOs versus international NGOs were formalized. And for me, I really found that most interesting um, when we think of funding streams. So how is the money coming in? Who's funding this work? Who's telling us it's important or otherwise? So I only threw in one data point for you all, um, but this was one I found really interesting. Out of that national registry, and so these are only what we're gonna, I keep calling the formalized nonprofits. There are a lot that aren't included in this data. Um, in 2015, there were about 5,200 organizations that were registered. And, oh, I'm sorry, this list is only 5,218. Did I write the note? It was over 6,000 that were registered. But these were the top um, missions of those types of organizations. In the Dominican Republic, there's an opportunity for um, governmental persons, legislators, or the executive branch to set up an organization. And so at that um, counting, over 2,000 organizations were presidential of this note, um, and they could have been for a mismatch of uh, missions. But then after that, what rose to the top was that education, health, and recreational sports were of import um, to these communities, that these were spaces where civil society was standing up, was saying, there's something that we want to help solve, um, there's something that maybe we want to change. And so um, that in itself, I think, was a strength. You'll see that it aligns with um, AIND, or Estrategia Nacional de Desarrollo, the National Development Strategy for 2030 in the DR. Um, this education and health really works through uh, the idea of lowering poverty and um, limiting inequality. So um, on the other end, if I slip over to the idea of the external environment, I think through, I don't know how relevant this list is anymore. I don't know that there's time where people are able to piece through and pull out groups that have disbanded. Don't know um, if all of the board presidents and the email addresses are really active. So if I wanted to meet up with an NGO that had maybe formalized in Puerto Plata in 2012, I'm still gonna find them. <laughs> um, and that was one enhancement that I thought would be really neat in the sector, if there would be the time and the passion for uh, the Center of NGOs to take that to the next step. And that's awesome as an academic, because then we could really see what changes are happening um, at a deeper level. So overall, um, I'm generalizing this, this might be part of your daily work, but the function of the report, again, was to help practitioners. I introduced this idea of a SWOT analysis, and so just <coughs> took a look in my writing of what strengths we saw um, in the internal environment or weaknesses, and then on the external, what were some opportunities and threats. And so um, this was definitely a heady project, and I invite discussion about it, because I might not agree with myself when I wrote it, <laughs> which is some of the fun part of being part of these groups and um, really thinking about what's going to uh, work in each of our contexts. Uh, but just to pull out a few uh, that were found in this investigation, some of the opportunities that I saw at the time for the Dominican Republic included um, some more constitutional provisions, again, some building up of the institutions behind uh, these groups. Uh, opportunities, I saw active civil society, and I've only been intrigued more um, when I reach about, read about Marche Verde and what's happening now, and just the idea of freedom to express yourself in country. Um, it's great when there already is mindset from leadership to have a global mission, and when there's a growing economy which is gonna produce new resources. Um, the strong religious heritage I pulled out and it might be my bias because I'm an American with an American research background. This is what we um, talk about in the United States, that so many nonprofit groups were started out of the Catholic or Protestant churches, and that's embedded in our history. And you see that heritage, that Catholic heritage of charity um, and caring for community also in the DR. And then again, back to how um, the DR has it all, sitting right there at the North and South Divide, access um, and interests 
that geopolitical position really gives great opportunity um, for our NGO work in the area. And then backing up to the, the threats, which can be a stronger word than maybe needed, but um, the idea that um, the registration process was laborious, it, it has a cost. It has of time and understanding and financial. Um, so maybe your grassroots groups will never decide to formalize. Um, and then we won't maybe have the same manners of networking and, and utilizing them. Um, the common to government abroad, this is not just the DR. We use our blanket words of corruption and clientelism and public mistrust, which can maybe mean different things to each reader. Um, that's all NGOs. <laughs> um, access to education and economic inequality. We see a lot of data from international groups encouraging even more changes in that area in the Dominican Republic. And um, moving to the last one, it, there can be a lot of centralization in Santo Domingo. I was lucky to have an opportunity to be placed there and see some groups um, and how they're able to work together. Alianza ONG doing great work in that space. Um, but when we think of our smaller groups, we also have to think of our groups that are more um, outside of that initial box and that might be looking for some of the resources even just to register in their local um, AG or Attorney General office or um, maybe looking for more workshops or more publications that come to them rather than them having to come into the capital. So um, again, all fodder for discussion. And I'll just close and, and open a time where we can speak a little bit more about what NGOs might need. Um, again, holding that the voluntary sector is good and right. What are um, we doing as a global society for our global citizens? Because I think people in the voluntary sector are passionate and want to find solutions. How are we going to get there together? And so um, I really just want to invite you to think through some of these ideas with me, how we might be able to streamline our processes, how we might invest more in our social and economic capital, how we might enforce accountability measures, and not only how we might, I'm interested to hear how you've already seen it done, what improvements you know of, because when we can take good case studies and replicate, we'll all be stronger. So again, I thank you for this time and just look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Megan. I know that you missed your time in the DR. I also, I know living in the Florida is like the Caribbean, right? Now, taking advantage of technology, uh, we would like to introduce to the last speaker, Severin Carminati that will join us via Skype today. Severin holds a law degree in Paris 11th University, France, and has specialties in commercial law and intellectual property, as well as labor law. Has been working for almost a decade with NGO nonprofit organizations in the Dominican Republic, and since 2013, holds the position of program officer in Alianza ONG a network of the third 31 Dominican civil society organization working to contribute to the sustainable development of the Dominican Republic by promoting, coordinating, and guiding the role and contribution of non-for-profits. He previously worked as a director of the training and volunteer of the organization TESHO in the Dominican Republic. Thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Yamile and, uh, and the GFTT for this opportunity. Really happy uh, to be here uh, today with you, uh, thanks to technology. Uh, first of all, we'd like to, to praise the initiative of uh, the Fellows Program of the GFTT and, uh, and this many results as uh, highlighted by Mr. Batista. Batista. Uh, and it's really important indeed to, to help understand better uh, this, the American public in general and its challenges, and in this case, the, the challenges and opportunities of civil society. So, <clears throat> I'm really glad to be here and to bring a little um, a little um, uh, sand to uh, the, the debate and the discussion. So, the, first of all, uh, and I would like just to briefly like 
the work of Megan is, is really interesting and we've been missing uh, such uh, academic uh, uh, study of uh, the Dominican Republic civil society sector. Uh, instead of NGO, we like to use the civil society organizations uh, here in Alianza ONG. Uh, it's not difficult to, to, to pick to that, to, have a, to use a word that can actually reflect the, the, the diversity of uh, the non-profit sector. And uh, as uh, Megan was, was uh, saying uh, very correctly, because we're talking about uh, community-based organizations, faith-based organizations that are usually uh, linked to uh, the churches. We have uh, INGOs with uh, offices in the American public and we have big national uh, NGOs and organizations uh, from the American public as well. So it's a big diversity and I think it's, uh, this is one of the strong characteristics of the, the American uh, civil society uh, between the all the organizations uh, with the tradition of, uh, of working in service, especially in terms of health and education, and uh, a, a, number, a high number of uh, new organizations. And so it's always difficult to, to grasp and uh, understand what are the challenges of all those organizations and how, what kind of solutions they can explore to actually overcome those challenges. So I think this study uh, uh, could be the first of uh, many others um, to help understand better the situation and the Dominican public and how it's, uh, it's moving uh, towards uh, a better civil society, a more an enabling environment uh, of work for uh, citizen civic action uh, together with the government and the private sector uh, working together to work towards the SDGs and the, the, the sustainable development. Because uh, now with this global agenda, we have some really clear lines and uh, objectives and goals to, uh, to achieve. And we only know, we know that we can only achieve it working together. So um, that, that's, uh, that's uh, for starter. And in, in, in this um, idea, and there are some things that I've been, uh, I've been feeling in, in the, the presentation and the report by, uh, by Megan, in which uh, uh, Maybe it's a difficult perspective, but it's the idea that uh, civil society and organizations uh, sometimes need to adjust to uh, local context. That uh, some missions uh, working with the most vulnerable uh, sometimes are not valued by uh, the public, private, public sector and the American public, or uh, difficult with difficulties by uh, the international cooperation organizations and so on. Uh, and this is something I think is quite important to uh, acknowledge the importance of our civil society needs to lead uh, the, in this uh, challenge of uh, the sustainable development. And uh, we cannot leave anyone behind. And so I think it's really important that even though we have a wonderful uh, um, and beautiful institutional framework with the Strategia Nacional de Desarrollo and uh, in its application and implementation by the, by the government, I think and many organizations are aligned to this, uh, this tool and mechanism. I think it's important that it doesn't matter if your organization is working on a topic which is not uh, included, because this document, this National Estrategia Nacional de Desarrollo, is not, it's a good, it's a good document, but it's not perfect, and so we cannot limit ourselves to what's in there. Uh, and so I think it's really important too. Even though some sectors working with migrants, working with LGBT communities, working <coughs> with uh, um, HIV in the Dominican Republic and uh, sexual and reproductive rights. Those are the most important issues for, uh, for the, every country nowadays, especially <coughs> here in, uh, in the Caribbean. And I think it's not because uh, those, the focus is not put on those priorities necessarily by uh, the government or uh, institutional organization that means that civil society organizations and NGOs can uh, forget those issues because it's their job and it's our, <coughs> our mission to make sure that everyone's rights is uh, defended and, and to promote those rights and uh, ensure that uh, through dialogue and action uh, and advocacy we can uh, put those items in the, in the agenda. So I think it's a, it's a really important thing and that's why in, in the context of SDGs uh, we can be proud of uh, the American public and uh, the way it's been uh, implementing a mechanism of uh, a participatory mechanism for the implementation of SDGs. 
uh, with the uh, uh, Sustainable Development uh, Committee, uh, uh, in which uh, various civil society organizations and NGOs are participating. And, and the idea is to work together uh, towards those SDGs. And so uh, when in uh, July, uh, in June, the first uh, voluntary uh, report on the implementation of SDGs will be presented by the Dominican Republic, um, and I will have to thank the, the ambassador uh, to the nation, United Nations for his presence uh, today. Uh, this is a really important moment for the Dominican Republic and possibly um, society in, uh, in because because we've been working together and we want to push uh, together to have more mechanisms of uh, participation, not only from uh, the, our organizations that are more stable and have more capacity, but from everyone at the local level. And this is one of the big challenges that, uh, in, uh, in the Dominican Republic. It's reflected in the, in the report by, uh, by Megan. It's the verticality uh, we can find, which is historical because of uh, the dictatorship, because of the, the presidential uh, uh, constitution, and the fact that uh, everything in the Republic comes back to the president. And I think, uh, and so it's to Santo Domingo. That's why uh, this, uh, we can, we can, this can help us understand why there are so many organizations in Santo Domingo. It's because everywhere, everything happens. It's close to the political power, and naturally, economical power is also here. Even though in Santiago and in all the uh, regions of Santa Barbara, the Mexican Republic, there are so many great organizations doing so much work. But uh, at the end, with the, with the, the, the government system they say in the Dominican Republic, it's difficult to work because uh, to, uh, already the, the not is not implemented on the um, the decentralization of the government. And so this verticality of the power is something that uh, also affects the, the, the improvement of the, the, the work of uh, NGOs. And uh, <clears throat> on, there's one point which is really important. It's uh, regarding what Megan was showing about uh, the presidential NGOs um, in, in this, uh, this little chart. And it's because the organizations are, are uh, registered to work with presidential, uh, with the presidency, are not are not necessarily uh, created by legislators or uh, or the president or uh, government. On the contrary, this is exactly what happens when uh, a tradition of decades of uh, charity managed by the central power makes uh, many small organizations be like. I can get help. I can work to work with, uh, as I say, the health ministry or the education ministry. Let me go straight to the president, and that's unfortunately something that uh, a culture of uh, verticality that is still ongoing and is something that needs to change. And the government is working on that, uh, especially in the center for uh, promotion of uh, nonprofits, which, uh, on the past two years, I'm sure that Megan will be happy to hear that has been moving uh, quite. Uh, fast towards a better implementation of the legal framework, the, the Lei 122 uh, the law uh, 122-05, which uh, creates the, the framework for NGOs in the American public. It has some really interesting mechanisms and, uh, to promote the work together of organizations and line ministries, and that's something uh, that we've been seeing some really big improvements uh, on those past two years in the capacity of this center to uh, improve its registry of uh, organizations and with the help of the World Bank, uh, now they have uh, a really good uh, um, ITC system, uh, technological system to uh, register organizations that will allow uh, this year to, to submit um, grants uh, uh, to ask for grants through the, this portal, as well as uh, there's some really st important uh, agreements between this center and the Ministry of Economy and uh, with the tax and revenue institution, uh, the AE, and other uh, really key organizations in the managing and overlooking the, the work of NGOs in the American public. For example, there's a really inter interesting thing with the um, on money laundering. Money laundering is a big issue for uh, many countries in the Latin American uh, region. And the Republic since last year has been um, uh, working to
to uh, for the evaluation of the uh, financial task force by Latin America, Gafri Lat, uh, which has all a series of, uh, of elements and uh, recommendations, one of which is specifically uh, tackling the non-profits. And there, uh, there are some uh, interesting the recommendations made by the government is that the non-profit sector, the metropolitan is not at risk as much as it can be perceived in the region because of some uh, movements and actions that civil society organizations have been um, uh, pushing on the last years. And, and here I want to mention the code of conduct of, uh, organ of civil society organizations that Alianza Nehe, my, my organization, has been uh, working on. And since last year, we have almost uh, 100 organizations that um, subscribe this kind of conduct. And I think we think it's a really important uh, step towards uh, better transparency and accountability of uh, NGOs, because this is the key for the, to uh, manage uh, legitimacy uh, of organization and the sector in general. And for example, uh, the sister organization of the GFDD in the Republic Public, uh, from Glory, uh, signed uh, and subscribed this, uh, this kind of conduct and it's one of the strong organizations that have been uh, moving towards this uh, auto-regulation of the sector. And so in this, in this regard, we feel it's really important because it helps us affirm what uh, civil society is and uh, improve the legitimacy. And therefore, this will help us uh, improve the funding because uh, as um, it was explained really uh, uh, clearly by um, the two previous um, exponents, the crisis of the corporation uh, combined with the um, the medium income status of the middle <coughs> are creating a big gap in, in the funding from uh, the traditional uh, corporations. So organizations, big and small, have to find new ways uh, uh, and to be creative and to go towards crowdfunding, uh, private sector, individual funding, and uh, there's a big change and there's, a, uh, there's some interesting actions from organizations on this area. So yes, it's a big challenge in the funding, but uh, also to, uh, to solve. And just looking at that one second, I have a couple of minutes, right? Yes, two more minutes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, I so, um, yes, to, to, to finish, and, and, excuse me. Uh, so yeah, this challenge of, of legitimacy um, is, is, uh, is really important. And uh, the general public in the American public is not always trust, doesn't trust NGOs, uh, especially NGOs that come from abroad. And so this is, trust is something that is so um, feeble and difficult to build, to build. It takes time, energy, and commitment. And uh, you have to just look at, the, at civil society in the American public with this eye of diversity. And uh, most of the, most of organizations are on a really community level. We're talking about the neighbor groups. But at the end, those are the ones that are called to have the, the bigger uh, impact uh, by the numbers and the, the scope of their action because we have a low in the public for participatory budget on the, on the local level with the mayors and the cities in which uh, small organizations and neighbor groups can be uh, uh, looking for funding for the community activities. And, uh, and, and because this sector of the non-profit in the American public we have to look at it through this eye of uh, professionalization, of our practitioners, uh, as uh, uh, Megan was saying, but also through the eye of uh, volunteering, because it's a voluntary sector, but volunteering is key to uh, the civil society and the American public and the non-profit sector. Um, in, here at Alianza Arnehe, we've been doing uh, sort of some studies about uh, volunteering, and we found out um, in 2013 that most of the volunteering in the American public was done by people under 30. And so we, there's a, a, a strong involvement of, of the youth in volunteering activities. And so and on this volunteering depends the, the survival of the, the civil society because funding is low, capacity is, is uh, to, to pay, 
and to have employees is, uh, is not uh, easy for everyone. So many, many organizations rely so much on volunteering and that's one of the things that have been also uh, uh, highlighted by Megan in her uh, report. So I just wanted to stress how important this is uh, to continue uh, foster the values of solidarity and uh, especially uh, volunteering because uh, the non-profit sector and the economic depends on everyone and, uh, and, it's, and it's capacity of uh, get moving and getting some funding from individuals uh, through remittances that are really strong uh, in, uh, in, in the case of the American public and uh, all the strategies to achieve more stability and recognition in order to uh, in, a, in an effective relation with the government and the private sector towards the sustainable development. And here on the, on the, on the last point, academia and the universities are so important for that because it's uh, the only way to build capacity within the Dominican uh, people to uh, actually uh, improve and work on the, on the civil society and non-profit uh, sector is uh, through the opening of uh, masters, of courses, of um, all a series of workshops and, uh, and opportunities for people to uh, get the skills that will allow them to work more efficiently in organizations. So uh, again, SDGs is a complex and uh, ambitious uh, goal and we, we understand here in the American public that the only way uh, the government can make it is, and the country can make it, is working to work with civil society as it's been starting to do and we're looking, we're always advocating for more uh, space uh, for the participation of uh, our uh, civil society organizations, working together with the private sector uh, that can help uh, for funding and, uh, and to uh, amplify the, the scope of organizations and also with the academia uh, for the, in the academy for the improve, to improve the capacity uh, of the sector. So uh, those are yeah, some brief comments and uh, I'd be uh, really interested to, to hear what the people over there in New York have to say and uh, to continue talking about this uh, really interesting topic. Thank you for attention. Thank you, Severine, so much for your comments. Uh, I would like to open the floor if anyone would like to say something or any comments. Uh, there is a microphone. Please present yourself. Vas ahora a Bella from Dominican Republic. It's, uh, okay, I want to say thanks to Megan for taking your time. You went to DR. And you spent some time over there. This is uh, very good. Uh, I got just one question, uh, uh, one comment. Uh, thanks to Severin, he's uh, understanding very well the, the role of the NGO and, and, and Dominican Republic. Very good. My question is, uh, uh, Megan, by any chance you come on across to f how the voluntary sector in DR really making some impact in, in education and, and social and see uh, I, I know we as a, as, as a country we have so many problems it's not a, it's, it's not easy I know why the government they don't track sometime in the, in the sector I saw you and you, in your first graphics, you put it the international statistical databases. I don't know if you if you look at the local databases. Sometimes people they don't trust in whatever numbers the government put it. Right? See, we know all this is. But my question is, we have we have to find a way because the government put money in all these NGO and the national budget we give it money to them. So. We had to find out what is the impact of this NGO they make in education and the health. See, we had to find a way. And uh, something we had to try to, to do is we had to create an organization who can bring all these NGO together. Sometimes they don't have no idea what they're doing. They just, they just I don't know, they just create an, an NGO, they go going out looking for her. But we, we, we need an umbrella. Some, Someone who can say, okay, guys, we have 45,000 NGOs in education. Everyone doing whatever they want. But they don't know exactly what to do. You see, that's something I would be very happy. You, maybe, your organization who already 
have very uh, 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 around the world. You 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 doing a lot to create something in, in, in DR, international conference, so you can bring all these NGO together. You try to, to 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 teach these people how to make different in the life of the the local community or whatever. Because I know we got so many problems. It's a it's, it's, it's poor country, developing country, small country. We try to do the best. But we'd be very good if we definitely we can teach them to, to really how to make impact in, in, in the life of the, the whole car or the whole country. But in general, uh, thank you for to spend your time in the arm. Yeah, yeah, as I see, uh, that, was, that was very good. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Severin. Okay. Um, well, I appreciate your comment because I agree wholeheartedly. And I think what's interesting about the question of have we seen an impact? is um, everything that you're mentioning about the DR is not limited to the DR. This is the question that across the voluntary <coughs> sector, nonprofits, we're trying to say, how do we measure this? Especially now in the time of big data, <coughs> right? Because I can tell you, and you asked, you know, did I see this? And I did because I saw practitioners um, in cities, in summer camps, and um, pulling girls that used to be in sexual abuse and going and taking care of their emotional needs so that they can study and learn in a different way. So to me, I would say yes. And within the timing of my report, I saw that. But um, these are the same questions that we should be asking um, at this national level as we do on the um, Millennium Development Goals and things of that nature. How do we really measure what moves the needle? And um, there's a, probably a lot of excuses about why we don't know that yet, right? Timing, professionalism, agreement on what needle needs to be moved and how. Um, and even just funding. But I would say you, you opened that big area that is a great question that people really should step into um, in the DR and across the world. And so on top of that, you mentioned the idea of bringing groups together. And you can tell from my um, interactions that I enjoy that. But not everyone thinks that's the way that civil society will continue to grow or best grow. Um, and so I would be really interested to see how your local voices, um, whether Sabrine has something to say or otherwise, um, what the best way of what I like to call legitimizing that civil society sector really will be for the DR. Uh, first, I'd like to thank each of the three of you for uh, enlightening an area that is important to me. It, it, it's perhaps useful for you to understand why I'm here and what my passion is. Um, for the last several years, it's been my honor to work uh, with His Excellency and with President uh, Fernandez to attempt to um, bring STEM, STEAM education into the public schools um, in the DR. So um, I have a two-part question, uh, probably for all three of you. Uh, one, it would be very useful for me, and as an American, a U.S. citizen to a U.S. citizen, if you take the United States and its, its reliance on volunteerism, on um, giving back to society, whatever label, and I, I like uh, civil society as, as better than NGO, NGO always struck struck me as, as being an unfortunate phrase that, you know, like it's not going. <laughs> it's not. Uh, I, I like the idea of a contribution from civil society or by civil society. We have an intuitive sense of the, the significant power here in the U.S. of contributions from civil society through volunteerism, through aggressive contribution through a whole history of organizations from the Red Cross to the Salvation Army. If you were going to take that, say for example, as a five, how would you, based on the data that you've gathered, how would you rate, just as a guess, where the Dominican Republic is? Awfully unfair question. It is, but I actually can't wait for correction if I'm not agreed with. Um, I would put it squarely at three, and that is as much from what I saw as 
anticipation of all the informal groups and the work that they're doing. Um, and people like Ms. Bain from Alianza and they hey, was remarking to me, so if I didn't see it or the numbers aren't there, um, that there is a ground swelling. So I would say a three. So is it a three in participation or a three in efficiency? Ooh, participation. Okay. So there are a lot of people, what I, let me make sure I understand you. There are a lot of people who would like to participate. It seems from all of the discussion that seems to be somewhat fractured. Mm -hmm. So I would certainly echo what His Excellency said, which is it sounds like it might be a rare opportunity for some organization to be kind of the, the pulling together of these, these civil resources mm -hmm and say, okay, we're going to work on HIV, we're going to work on LGBTQ, we're going to work on education, education for a workforce specifically, education for a workforce moving towards global citizenship. Uh, if I, it's just a gratuitous comment, but uh, it would, what I hear you say is the society may be ready for that, and it's just a question of how somebody could pull that together. Again, let me thank you for your yeah. I think that the wide expanse of mission and objectives of NGOs contributes both to the promise of NGOs as well as the confusion that that practice generates. In other words, uh, say for example, uh, if we are to agree that working together on common public goods, if human rights and human dignity is a common public good, as much as democracy and development being public good, then imagining the collaborative platform based on the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals Agenda 2030 becomes therefore a venue where the, the imagination of government officials about NGOs and the imagination of NGOs about government officials come into play because they work together in pursuing certain common public goods. I think that's what uh, the, His Excellency is saying about coming together, exhibiting the best of the accountability, the transparency, the mobilization of funds that are accountable, and what, what's the provenance of this money, and how is it being spent, what is it, its impact. Sometimes they are far more imagined than real. And it becomes real only if we work together. And, and to me, the sustainable development goals and, and its targets are a rich, it provides a rich possibility for exhibiting the good intentions of, of, of the two sides. Uh, uh, in the field, for example, of humanitarian and development work, uh, and I heard this. Uh, many times over in the many in the many meetings related to the global compact on migration, that there is a large portion of the mobilization of funds and resources, including human resources, being done by civil society, filling the gap uh, in terms of uh, the inadequate response of governments. I say this, for example, during the Marcos period, uh, in the Philippines where the health sector was underfunded and understaffed. It was civil society that provided what are called community-based community -based health programs. The problem though is that the government praised the community-based health programs by civil society so much that the government started to no longer do its own share of health programs because civil society do it so well. and so. The, the corrective for that, again, is to come together in a, in a common platform so that say, hey, government, this is really your primary responsibility. We're doing it well, but you know, unless there is a national budget appropriation for uh, health and that we can mobilize that money together, uh, this will not, in the long run, be sustainable. So I think uh, uh, that's so it. wants to say something? Yeah. <coughs> Yes, uh, thank you. Well, those are some really interesting comments from uh, all of you. And uh, uh, 
I am really like to second uh, the, the last comment by Mr. Bautista, because civil society will never replace the governments. We, we don't just don't have the, the money, uh, and we never meant to have uh, the money and the funding to achieve this level of scope. Now, we, looking at the Dominican Republic, like the like Philippines, there's some sectors in which the government is not reaching and, uh, the, the population. They say health in rural, uh, mountainous areas. How are they dealing with that? They talk about um, uh, all the, the issues of discapacidad. Um, and like, there's, there's some issues in which, uh, especially in the health and education in the Dominican Republic, and we, in which we've seen historically the Dominican Republic, uh, the, the civil society replacing the government. And the, the push, the, the movement, what we've been advocating is like, Government, look at the, how others are doing it, learn from them, and do it at the national level and to everyone. And that's the, that's the, the role of one of the roles of civil society is to some in the locations in which it's needed to show the governments, whether it's national or local governments, how to do things the the, the correct way, you know, to leave the one behind and to satisfy everybody everybody's needs. But and this is the advocacy that we are, we, are, uh, we need to do, and so this is the only way to to make it work because we will never have the capacity uh, to uh, or the funding to actually uh, provide services uh, that government should do uh, should provide. Uh, about the, the, what the those those two, two brief comments about the impact and uh, the the network and uh, how the idea of having those. Uh, super uh, network of NGOs that would. Uh, there, there's uh, some. Uh, the, the sector is quite organized in so on certain uh, topics. For example, in uh, in health, in childhood uh, issues, there are some national networks that will work this issue uh, to work with uh, together with 50 or 100 organizations uh, focused on. Uh, and then that. Uh, for example, it's like the, the one all the women's group, the uh, microfinances, all those organizations are working together in uh, thematic and uh, topic uh, networks. Uh, but it's not possible to do it uh, at all the levels because of other, again, diversity. And it's something with the civil society, it's like, it is so difficult to uh, be able to um, accurately um, represent and delegate the voice and the, the ideas and the, the, the the diverse missions of organizations within one single organization. So that's why we always advocate for uh, um, activities that would allow for more participation, more people from the diversity of regions, not only of uh, uh, shops and Domingo, but also in the, the different cities of the countries, because the only way is, uh, is to work, uh, yes, with networks, but we cannot forget that every organization is different has been created in the different context uh, by different group of people and uh, it's important to respect. About, about the impact to, to finish, uh, oh yeah, I can tell myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, about the impact, this is an important uh, uh, question, about how can we measure the impact of uh, civil society? Uh, and it's the same question that we can probably get everywhere and now with the SDGs we're all working on that. And the answer is easy. It's uh, Stop to forget the um, to let aside the the, the the false visions that we had of other sectors and that other sectors, especially the public sector, has of civil society. Because the only way the government can include uh, or get civil society organizations' impact and uh, activities and programs within its work towards the SDGs is by listening to them, inviting them to participate in, uh, in, consult in um, uh, consultory proce processes and mechanisms, is listening to them because historically the government has been looking at civil society as like charities, like, oh yeah, it's nice what they do, it's great, we're happy to help them. But it's not about helping them, it's about working together. And it's something that needs to change. At the global and local level, it's a relationship. And, uh, the power relationship between uh, uh, international organizations, governments, uh, private sector, and NGOs, and civil society in general. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Severine. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Levy. It has been a pleasure to have you all here talking about the importance of the NGO and the voluntary sector, not only in the DR, but 
or worldwide. Thank you for your questions, comments, and participation, and hope to see you soon in another GFDD event. Good evening. Thank you, Sarah. Bye-bye. And I'm welcome to you,